Hello and welcome to the big picture. The role of social sciences in analyzing and understanding the society can never be em emphasized enough. Social scientists are, it is said, the backbone of a society. So their work naturally has to be given the importance it deserves. Research in the area of social sciences therefore acquires key importance. An international conference going on in the capital is looking at the status and role of social science research in Asia and the engage emerging challenges and policy issues. In this context, we will look at how social science research can help in governance and development. In the election season that India is in, it would be topical to see how much social science research can lead government policy as well as assist political parties in formulating their policies. And equally importantly, how the political parties use social science research or use it at all. We will discuss all this with an eminent international panel of guests. I have with me Professor Sukhdev Thorat, Chairman of Indian Council for Social Science Research, Annette Nicholson, Vice President, International Development Research Center, Canada, Dr. Hari Sharma, Director, Alliance for Social Dialogue, Nepal, Dr. Shamshul Amri Bahadur, Baharuddin, Distinguished Professor at the Institute of Ethnic Studies, National University of Malaysia, and Dr. Intia Ahmad of the Department of International Relations, University of Dhaka, Bangladesh. Welcome to all of you. Uh, Professor Thorad, I would like to come to you first. You have been in this business for a very long time and you have also interacted with you know, politicians, political parties and things like that. Do you think that the social science research in India is you know, aimed at driving policies or helping policy makers and lawmakers? Yeah, indeed. I think the, the, the very role of the social science research is to understand the society, right. economy and polity and to understand the problem and find out the reason as to why those problems exist and then suggest the solutions. So most of the social science research not only develop an understanding but also it uh, lead to the policies which the government is supposed to uh, uh, take and try to deal the issue. So social science research has a very important role in developing evidence-based po policies and addressing the problem in the country. But the, the question is this, evidence-based, yeah. how much of these evidence-based policies are actually looked forward to by the political class? Do they, do, do you think that they are interested in this kind of evidence-based policy? Because we see, we are, the allegation against the political class in this country is that their policies are, are driven by vote banks or you know what they think will get them votes. Do you see a, a, a mismatch in what the social scientists uh, approach this, in the, in the way the social scientists approach this and the way the politicians approach, approach this? No, I think we, I mean all our policy making body uh, do make use of the research and they, they themselves have uh, wings and administrative division which undertake research. For example, planning, planning, planning commission. commission, they have their members but they have a policy evaluation unit which undertake research, sponsor research, evaluate the scheme and that is how they frame the programs and the... Uh, That's how they are supposed to frame that, the programs. That are supposed to do that and of course there is a chain of think tanks in the country which they try to make use of certainly. The problem lies somewhere else. The problem lies somewhere else in the sense that there is an, some sort of underfinancing and there is a bulk of the area remain under research. Under research. research. So That's exactly the point. As a result, government often then make decision based on the committees and the uh, and uh, is government is compelled to make decision on limited evidence and data. under researched and I, I suppose underfunded also. Yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah. I'll come to Annette Nicholson. Uh, Annette, you know, you belong to this uh, international organization. Your job is to fund this kind of projects. Are the international funding agencies a little touchy when it comes to issues of, when it comes to, you know, political issues? Well, we certainly don't comment on the politics of other nations, but uh, we, at the same time, do fund researchers in the countries in which we work who supply uh, the results of their research to policymakers, and we have no trouble doing that. But if, 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 the, if, the, if the issues are such that they, can, they are politically touchy, mm -hmm. would, you, would you still encourage that, that kind of research? Well, the, if the research is of high quality, and it's generating uh, results that can be uh, justified, then we're happy to fund research um, that feeds into the, the process of, of, of policy making. And policy making is complex and, and research is part of uh, what goes into it. 
and uh, you know what's what's been your experience internationally and do you think that the policy makers the political class the governments are are you know look forward to this kind of uh, this kind of research do they do they do they approach you people to you know get get certain things done which they want to know about do you, do you see that kind of a uh, you know approach from the political class or we we are seeing that in the in the various countries in which we work that there is a demand for the results um, of the research that our uh, grantees are doing. And one of the things that we encourage is the, the researchers that we work with to engage with the policymakers early on to ensure that there is a demand for that kind of uh, research and to ensure that they are attacking, they're, they're framing their question in a way that the results might actually be useful to policymakers. Uh, okay, Dr. Sh uh, Shamshul, uh, what is your experience in, the, in, this, in this area, in Malaysia, for instance? Well, I think there was uh, this ethnic riot in 1969. And I think that traumatic experience, uh, with the help of uh, bodies like uh, Harvard University Development uh, S Service and also Agricultural De Development Council New York, the one of the preconditions to get money was to introduce social science in the university. So actually there was a conscious effort to introduce social science as problem solver. So in many ways, uh, the formulation of what we call the new economic policy in the post-1969 has a lot of social science components. So it somehow set us some work to do for the next 30, 40 years. But nevertheless, uh, we also want to develop basic research in, we call it fundamental research right. in social science, because we have to think. We just can't keep on supplying solution when actually some of these are already experienced and done somewhere else. So I think there are two components, the basic research and the applied research has to be in tandem to allow one to enrich the other. So I think this is what we see. In and what, what, can, you, can you give us some examples of this? of both these aspects of the research in Malaysia, which, which has helped the larger okay. society and, the, and, you know? Well, there is this uh, fetish about unity in diversity. Yes. I mean, all societies are diverse yes. in many ways. So for Malaysia me... Malaysia is one of the most diverse societies. So the issue now is, how do we deal with diversity? Because diversity, there are three phases of diversity. One, a diversity that is positive. We celebrate diversity. Right. We have Mal visit, visit Malaysia here this year. We are celebrating diversity. They got a lot of funds. But there's another side of diversity that we worry about. Right. Because diversity can cause or become potentially problematic. Right. And of course... Create this, tensions in the society. Okay, this will raise the third uh, phase of diversity, which is hope. Hope for one Malaysia, hope for united Malaysia. So you continuously uh, have to deal with these three simultaneously. And then on the unity side, you will never get unity as uniformity. It's always not unity, but social cohesion, cohesion. with a lot of contradictions. Now, you have to resolve each of these contradictions to allow some parts of the cohesion to move towards unity. How, mu how much of it is appreciated at the, at the government level, at the political parties level, at the political... I think they have no choice because in Malaysia, there is no real clear absolute majority in terms of population. Okay. It's only 52, 55% of indigenous and the rest are all migrant communities. Right. So, there, so there is a contestation between small majorities. Now, this is what makes it a lot interesting because nobody can govern on its own. So therefore, in Malaysia, it's always a coalition government, whether the opposition party coalition or the ruling party coalition. So in some ways, they need the social science input because at the moment, for example, uh, we have our parliament, we have our state legislative council. We are now running a national dialogue of unity all over the country, about 20 different cities. What is it for? We thought the public wants to speak. Because not everybody has access to internet. Right. So, so now, as we are talking, uh, we, uh, this, uh, what I call dialogue perpaduan, dialogue of unity, is going on where 100, 200, 500, 1,000 people are coming to say what they don't like about the society. Okay. This is the advantage that we right. have. Right. Uh, Hari Sharma. Dr. Hari Sharma, <laughs> you know, you know, first, uh, of, of course, about N Nepal has gone through a lot of uh, yes. crisis in the last decade mm -hmm. or so, and uh, it's still undergoing 
huge changes in the society itself how is it, how is it how does it get reflected in your in 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 nepal in the way the research is done another thing is you know this, i'm asking you a larger question which I, you know i others also should is there a lot of unfocused research happening in social science i think uh, uh, nepal's opening in the 1950s coincided with the uh, kind of global knowledge system on development so nepal was uh, kind of uh, very much experimented in the developmental research. Um, the, it's a unique position in South Asia is a landlocked nest, you know. Right. Again, the diversity, the mountains, um, all kind of things attracted, uh, plus it's under development, attracted a lot of work on development. So a lot of uh, development work is financed from outside. So I think in the uh, fundamental research side, there's a certain, you know, gaps. Gaps. Uh, but in the development literature, Nepal has made tremendous progress in terms of, you know, its own exemplary work on, you know, community forestries, uh, community radios, uh, especially in the 90s. Uh, and uh, with the coming of democracy in the 90s, uh, the, the, our preoccupation turned to more fundamental issues like right. democracy. Right. Uh, earlier, when there was a no, the no democracy, a small country, the legitimacy crisis was there. So international relations used to dominate the scene. Right. This is a Cold War. Right. So you find the um, very very uh, good literature on you know how a small nation survives. You know uh, the the role of small nation in a, as as a kind of active diplomacy, non-aligned. This was the kind of research, research you see. Yes. Uh, but when after 1990, we see a lot of changes in that sort of thing. In Nepal became much inward looking in that sense. Democracy becomes our preoccupations, which uh, is so necessary. In a, in a, in a, and, then, and then local government democracy yeah, needs this yeah, kind of the, uh, the local government government and, and, and the political party, social movement. And suddenly, um, the, you know, the unintended consequences, the Maoist insurgency right. came in. So there was a lot of focus on, you know, the um, conflict side of the Nepali society. Right. Earlier, Nepal was romanticized right. the land of Shangri-Las and that sort of thing. And suddenly, by mid-90s, we were turning into a kind of, you know, conflict study situation. So everybody was in Nepal to study conflict. Yes. Earlier it was a mountain, you know, Serpas, <laughs> Sangrilas, that sort of thing. Yeah. So with the dynamics that every society goes, the research priorities also change. Oh, right. uh, but the most important thing that uh, I, we always uh, the, the argue and articulate that every society needs to kind of fundamental social science research to try to understand its history, culture, uh, various facets. So earlier it was tilted towards development. In the 60s, it became more and more international relation, non-alignment, you know, small nation, you know, landlockedness. In the 90s, it became more democracy, sort of. So it's a coming and going of various issues. Uh, but the problem is the how do you discover your own history? Right. Uh, one of the myths uh, that we see all over is that Nepal never colonized. Nepal has a very independent status in the history. Uh, that has a kind of national psyche. And at the same time, Nepal is a peaceful land, suddenly turning into a violent conflict. Absolutely. So therefore, a kind of soul searching. So it's, a, it, 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 it's also, a, that means it's also a great challenge to the social it's scientists. Social science. And then, and then the, the, the sad part is that uh, history has been taken as a, as a as an instrument to articulate uh, new aspirations. But you look, look at into the departments. Uh, in the university, history department last year went, uh, you know, uh, nil. Nobody entered into history department. <laughs> everybody talks about politics, yeah, I mean, that, everybody is, talks about history, but suddenly nobody is studying this is, this history. Is, this is a problem which is happening, I, I, I guess, in all over South Asia, at yeah. least, in India, definitely. Uh, coming to Dr. Intiaz Ahmad, the, you know, Bangladesh again is a, 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 has gone through tumultuous times in the last several decades. But, you know, we have heard some great stories from uh, development stories from Bangladesh. How much of it has been driven by the social science? Well, in a big way, um, the problem in Bangladesh, I guess, in whole of South Asia is um, in order to have uh, a vibrant social science, you need to have a big civil society because you need dissenters. You can't have social science without dissenters. Right. Now, dissenters is something that the state feels very... You know, insecure, about. insecure about. Yeah, very insecure. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, one of the reasons, and I think uh, Mr. Thorat was using, you know, the funding problem, I think, one of the serious problem is the state feels tensed, uh, by, you know, giving funds to who is a dissenter. Uh, so what happened, I think, in uh, Bangladesh, uh, the changes that you see, particularly with the Human Development Index, almost came outside the government, actually. Okay. The NGOs, particularly big NGOs that we have. We have Grameen Bank, for example. Right. It's not an NGO, it's a bank, but BRAC, for example, Proshika. 
Um, and the kind of research that they were doing also very interesting, in fact. They, uh, Brack, for example. Now, these are all outside. Uh, the, the government, the government yet, yeah. And, but the government couldn't uh, do much because the kind of research they were doing were very relevant. Yes, there were dissenters, not to mention they were questioning the government, they were questioning the structures and all, but at the same time, they were also needed. So you had a kind of a tense relationship, but at the same time, you couldn't do away. You know, you can't just say, okay, I, I, I'm ignoring it. And I think that's still a problem because whole of South Asia, I think, uh, the civil society still remains uh, kind of, you know, a limited one, if I can uh, say that. And one of the reasons I think the state uh, still feels uh, very uncomfortable uh, Mainly because you know, if it is not, uh, if it doesn't suit you, then that it is, doesn't. That, you know, doesn't Dr. Torad, would you agree with that? We, do we st do we have that problem st in India also? No, I think uh, uh, if if I take an official position on behalf of Indian Council of Social Science Research, we have a lot of freedom. You know, we have uh, the major part of the research is what is called responsive research that anybody can apply for a funding, and it is through the expert committee. Uh, you select the proposal you, or the you, topic on which anybody want to work. But also we have... You have taken an official position. No. Now let us hear the unofficial position. This, this is a practical <laughs> position. I am talking of practical... I am talking of official organizing. <laughs> okay. So there is a practical... I am uh, a social scientist. Yeah. Me, I want to hear what you use as a social scientist. Keep their ICSSR for, aside for yeah. a moment. Yeah. Because you know we have... There are a lot of problems about it. The, one of the charges is that you know, there is too much of unfocused research happening in this country. Would you agree with that? No, I because you know, I look uh, no, at some of the no. some of the titles of the PhD programs in this country have nothing to do with what is happening on the ground. And, you know, even whether whether what uh, the, the Shamsul says that neither is it fundamental research or you know the other, applied, the other research. applied research. Yeah. You, don't no, you no, think no, that no, no, that's no, a I, situation? I, no, no. I would suggest that you, if you look at the most of the PhD work and the research projects, I think they are a lot more uh, related to the uh, contemporary problems, uh, and a lot of empirical research is done. Now, whether it is, it is indeed focused research because when you select the topic for research and empirical research, you do pick up the topic which can. But how the far society. are they? The question, the questions which are which are asked, how far are they relevant to the society? How far are they relevant to policy making? You know, let's talk of let's let's talk of applied research. For yeah. instance, you know, yeah. that's why in, in, in this is an election season. For instance, we were, yeah. I, you know. Now the election season is there, manifestos are being, um, you know, today, in fact, right now as we are speaking, the two political parties, which are the two major political parties are sitting and formulating the manifesto. How much of these manifestos, how much of the research which happens in this country are reflected in these manifestos? Well, I, I haven't seen the manifestos. No, no, even I in think, the past, in the past, I'm talking in the, in the, in the past. past. I think in the manifesto, they do look for the statistics, they look for the uh, expert advice and the recent, recent development is that they look, they are organizing the round tables uh, with the expert and seeking their opinion. But it is up to the political parties, I think, to take a final call on it. But they look, uh, they do look, uh, look for the uh, facts and the figure and the changes. But I would like... Are you happy, are you, are you happy with, the, with the state of affairs now? As a social scientist, are you happy with the way the, either the government, the political parties use this kind of, are you happy with that situation? I, th I, I personally feel that the, the base for manifesto, base for other decision making has to be the evidence based social science research right. and quite often it is not in, in some sphere if not in all sphere. And uh, there is an element of, at time, there is an element of uh, uncomfort uh, because the Which? social yeah social scientist brings out the problem of uh, for example we the poverty decline but the malnutrition remain right so so we had a the, discussion on yeah, that yesterday so ultimately <laughs> then uh, that this yeah we had a discussion here so discomfort remain but ultimately then in a democracy like ours ultimately it get registered in the right corner if the research is rigorous and uh, a, a appropriate well, and you you know at the larger international level how much you know uh, when you talk of research uh, should, is, is there is there an effort to make it politically neutral should research social science research be politically neutral well uh, the research that that we fund is applied research um, and that's not to you say know, when you talk of applied research the, Lord, the dynamics of politics is is very much a part of it and you and you can't completely ignore politics, and you also can't see it as illegitimate. It's perfectly legitimate, and and the research results are only one part 
of what goes into the decision making around policy. You know, there are interests that that need to be balanced. And so the research that, that we fund is really only one part of um, one of the inputs. So is it uh, pol politically neutral? Sometimes you can't even ask that or even answer that question. Okay, Shams, would you like to answer that question? No, I, <coughs> we do a lot of self-evaluation. Apart from Malaysia, I mean, what, are, what uh, is Generally, your we, we, I mean, as a template, yes. I would look to social science anywhere else. There are three R's that I look for. Are they providing relevant material to whether to society, to applied, or whatever you want to call relevant? Huh? Second, are you referred to? You may be relevant, but nobody actually wants to read your stuff. Right. Okay? So they gather dust. Huh? <laughs> and finally, if you are relevant, you are referred to, are you respected? Which means that do international bodies, national bodies, and regional bodies actually think of you or your research as relevant and can be referred to. So I think these are very critical in trying to make sense of the state and the position of social science anywhere, not only in Malaysia, anywhere else, and in India, for example. I know I, uh, Professor Torat has been doing a lot of work that is relevant. Now, are they referred to? And then you ask the question, are they respected? So I think these are issues that we play in our mind when we do things. It may not be as clear as that when we do many things, but I think in the end, uh, we can measure ourselves against those. And that's what, methods. you know, since, since you're all very eminent, uh, you know, social scientists from different parts, I, I would like to ask, I would like to flag another issue okay. which I want all of you to. You know, do social scientists avoid politically sub touchy subjects? No, I don't think so. You don't think so? By definition, they are political. The, by, by definition. definition. Yeah, I, yeah, I think uh, the, the, my earlier submission to this panel, that uh, the kind of uh, the debate around history, is a very political. Yeah. The kind of uh, issues around who are the people uh, is also very political. For example, all over South Asia, political parties are passing through a tremendous, you know, um, uh, challenge. Right. Uh, the party system in India, which Rajni used to describe as a Congress system, has passing through it, you know, very competitive. Our political parties fragmenting. The, is fragmentation of political parties a reflection of a society which is also fragmenting and you know, polarized? I think the, the questions that are, as he said, relevant, the relevant questions are always contentious questions yeah. because there is no simple answer to the social questions and social phenomena we have. And I think as far who is referred and what kind of thing goes into the, the two, policy... The, the two other R's uh, which Dr. Uh, Shamsul yes, mentioned uh, is very important. Very important. <laughs> and, and for example, then to me, uh, politics and policies are related. And you can't do a research in ivory tower. You have to learn. That, that is exactly what I... I in yes. Fact, all policy research are political, Politi uh, political I think in nature I in the sense the, that what kind of alternative would you would suggest is dependent on the group interest and depend on ideology. No, no, so I they I are have, essentially that, political. That, you know, that's, what, that's what it should yes. be. Yeah. I but think, I think but my question is, is, is it enough? What we what we are seeing in India or in in any other in I all the other countries, you know, because the all your countries was, are facing similar problems. The point that I was making is that simply doing research is not enough. How do you relate it to the where it matters? Absolutely. And then I think the, one has to understand the policy processes of the country. One has to understand how societies are changing. This right. is where social science became a bridge between you know the governmental institutions, state, and the societies. And we are part of the Dr. societies yes. in that respect. I have a little bit different take on this. You know, <laughs> somebody has to do policy irrelevant research also. Someone no. has to do a third no. century AD Cohen system. No, no, policy Somebody has to do... No, no, I, yeah. I, I, I like it because Dr. Shamshul said yeah. fundamental research is yeah. necessary. Exactly. Yeah. So, so, you know, when you get the word policy, it, 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 it can create serious problems. Yeah. Uh, one, for most of South Asia, it could be donor driven. That yes. could be one yeah. because yeah. they need a quick uh, response to that. It could be economic driven, which may not be agreeable to you know, non-economists and other groups. of It could be partisan-driven, which yes. is very critical, because you're referring to the manifesto. A lot of research goes into that, but a lot of, our, it's a partisan research, because, you know, people want to put in the manifesto. Exactly. Way. So one has to be very careful with the word policy relevant. Uh, Dr. Torat, you know, I, I'll, since we're talking of, you know, political parties, what he said just now, for instance, in India, 
you know, we'll take this very specific example. There are several policies, several programs which have been implemented in this last decade or decade and a half. Very major stuff which seems to have changed the course of course of society, in fact, and uh, the economy also. Now, for instance, NREGA, the National Rural Employment Guarantee Act. You know, under that, we have had it now almost for ten years. Are th is there any social science research? Which has come out of it, which which comes out and says us, okay, how has it benefited? We 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 as journalists will always keep looking out uh, for you know data or evidence to. Otherwise, you know our our what we write or what we say as journalists is all you know fragmented information which we pick up when we are traveling or talking to people, but we don't have enough evidence on our hand. No, there is a considerable research on Narika and its effectiveness certainly. And in for instance, on migration. How has migration in this country uh, uh, come down because of Narega? I have been trying to look for you know solid evidence for that or material for that. It's very difficult to find. Yeah, there are selective studies. There, there are certainly selective studies that uh, on on the how the Narega has stopped the seasonal migration. Right. You know, it is precisely during the slack season when there is no employment in the field. That was one that, of the. Yeah, that was one that, of the. Uh, you yeah. know, ideas of this it, behind it, this. It has reduced. There are studies which uh, show uh, it has reduced, and there are studies which also study the effectiveness and implementation of the Narega. And it comes out that there are. It has a very good impact, but it has its own limitation. There are huge interstate variation. It is why, while it is effectively implemented in some of the western state, the story from eastern no, state is no, not. Uh, that's right. We, I am asking. So, for instance, other, I, I'm sorry. You know, if, I'm sure you people also follow what is what is happening here. For instance, reservation is a major issue in this country. How much of how much of uh, you know? Evidence-based research has gone into you know, issues like reservation. I don't know. I mean, what, I don't know what is the situation in your countries about you know reservation or whatever you call it, uh, whatever, whatever you call there. Here, for instance, SCST reservation has been in this country for the last 60 years or more. Yeah. Yeah. What has been the impact of that? I, I, you know, it's very difficult no, to find. There are, for that. I agree with you. There are studies, but there are limited studies. Nevertheless, there are. And I think those studies being out that the reservation in education, in employment, and in politics, it had a positive impact, particularly on uh, education and subsequently through the channel of education on employment. Let me tell you that if you look at the recent 2011-12 employment unemployment, if you take the proportion of worker in this country for the scheduled caste between public and the private, the proportion of the scheduled caste and scheduled tribe worker in the public, that is in the government, is I'm higher sorry. than their population. No, no, I'm sorry, they have, they have I'm sorry, Professor Turan, I have to cut yeah. you because you know we're running out of time. Yeah. Yeah. No, there is no doubt that person like you will know a lot of things about that. How much of it is gets communicated to the people? How well, much of this well, kind of research? Well, I, gets... I tend to agree with you. There are huge themes where there is no, there is limited research. Absolutely. I want all yeah. of you to, uh, yeah. Annette, would you agree with this kind of, uh, you know, that there is this huge gap? Uh, uh, about these things, we are not talking of India. I don't know what is the, what is your international experience. Well, the experience that we have is that uh, the uh, social sciences are contributing to policy, not in every case, and not always successfully. Not always successfully. But they are trying. Yes. No, Shamsul. Well, we have affirmative action policy. Okay. And. How much of it? How much of it is driven by social science research? How much of you know the most important? For instance, I'll tell you, um, there is now a talk in this country that several generations of scheduled castes and scheduled tribes have, you know, uh, taken the advantage of this reservation. Now, should there be an exit policy? Now, something like this is a very, very touchy and very, very sensitive mm -hmm. subject. Unless and until it is driven by good research, we will not be able to go anywhere on this. Would you agree? Well, good. And not good, I would say this way. In the context of Malaysia, uh, there is one group of research what I call ethnicization of research. Everyone says about how good I am or how good my community is. But how do you get out of that trap? I think exactly. that, is the that, is, that is that is that is that is where the research needs to be focused on. Would yes. you agree? Yes. Yes. Very quickly, both of you are are, we, are, we are passing through a very interesting time. Constitution is being drafted. Right. And various communities and various, you know, uh, minorities are demanding their place, rightful place in the societies. Definitely, the discussion around reservation is very important. And so and social scientists have a play, role to role play to there. Play, and I agree with this some rule that we need some sort of, you know, ethnicization has to be avoided. <laughs> yeah, very quickly, Imtiaz. 
So ask me anything. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think well, Bangladesh, as I said, it's uh, you know it's an issue which uh, you know I, I guess in whole of South Asia, uh, the problem of increasing partisanship is a is a serious problem, and uh, even social scientists are humans and they tend to be organically linked uh, to the power elite and all that. That's the problem that I think. Yeah, is I think I th and the last point which you made was very important. How social scientists get organically linked to power structures, and how that can, that could also create its own problems. But I, th I think we completely ran out of time, sorry, but it has been a very interesting and discussion. I'm sure uh, you know th this this kind of discussion should help in enhancing at least the importance of social science research in this country. Hopefully, the political class also will will take it more seriously than what they have been taking so far. Thanks to all my guests, Dr. Uh, Professor Sukhdev Thorat, Annette Nicholson. Dr. Shamshul, Hari Sharma and Imtiaz Ahmed. Please keep watching. We'll come back with another issue in the big picture same time tomorrow.